Thanks very much, and thank you, Jim, for the invitation. And I realize that I'm not standing between you and wine. So in case you want to leave halfway through, here's the story. There's a page. All of you have it, approximately. And it's cool because it evolves. So if you feel like a glass of wine, then you know what's going to happen. <laughs> um, this image is from, ironically, National Public Radio. Um, from some press they put out, we put out when, when we came up with the story. It's cool. My lab is a bioinformatics lab. We write programs to help you guys analyze the metagenomics data. So if you have a problem with metagenomics data, go talk to my students. They're all, all in the audience somewhere. Don't ask me, because I just travel around with talks. <laughs> um, but what I'm going to tell you about is this um, software crash that we wrote. And we're interested a lot in viruses. We love viruses. But viruses are tricky, which is that most of the genes in viruses, we don't know what they do. And this hasn't changed over the decades of sequencing. We still don't know what most of the genes in viruses do. So this guy, Balas Nutil, came to my lab. He uh, was a visiting scientist. And now he's an associate professor at the University of Utrecht in Holland. And Baz came, we were making a bunch of metagenomes, analyzing virums, and he said, you know, I got this idea. I want to um, take different metagenomes and assemble them together. So basically the idea is we start with a few metagenomes, we color them so that we can tell them apart. We don't really color them. <laughs> and then we do an assembly, like using one of the assembly algorithms, one of the common ones, and we end up with a bunch of contigs. So these are longer reads. We started with 100 base pair reads, 200 base pair reads. We're trying to make longer fragments of DNA. And some of our contigs only come from one of our metagenomes. Some of our contigs come from two of our metagenomes. And some of our contigs come from three or four or more of our metagenomes. And so the, the idea is that if you've got different samples and you've got fragments that have come from multiple different metagenomes, then maybe there's something interesting and related that's happening there. This is an idea that several people had at the same time. There's a bunch of different tools to analyze, uh, to, to perform this with metagenomics data. And we have a website where you can go, you just upload your files, and it will create these kind of things for you. So we needed a data set to try. And at the time Baz did this, um, Forrest, who's in San Diego with us, and Jeff Gordon published this paper where they had viruses from um, mothers and twins. So each mother has two twins, one pair. So you have four mothers and eight twins, 12 people in total. So there's 12 piles of poop. And they sequence the viruses. And basically, the take home of Alejandro Ray's paper is that microbes are really boring. They're all doing the same thing. The colors here are the different functions that the microbes are doing. Microbes are boring. You shouldn't study them at all. <laughs> um, viruses, these are the phages, because basically, when you sequence viruses from humans, you get phages. Viruses are cool. They're all doing different things. Here's our 12 samples, and they're all different. That was the, the take-home of, of Alejandro's paper. Baz wanted a data set to play with to test his new tool, and so he started with this data set because we had it lying around. What Baz found when he looked at his cross-assembly was something a little weird. So here we've got how many different samples contribute to a contig. And here we have how many contigs we get out. So if we look at the, the first column, we get about 5,000 contigs that only have one sample contributing to them. Then we have about 2,500 contigs where two different samples have reads that contributed. So maybe that was from one twin and the other twin, and they've got something that they're sharing. And as you expect, as we increase the number of samples that are contributing, we get less and less contigs, so we only get um, maybe 50 contigs that have come from seven different samples in this study. But what we found is that there are a group of contigs that where we're getting reads from every sample. So all of the mothers and 
all of the twins have DNA that looks like it comes from the same thing. So we pull out those reads, and we plot here the different samples, the different powers of poo, and the abundance of the contigs in those samples. So we have a line, so this line has this amount of relative abundance, it doesn't really matter what the y-axis is. Now, in this sample, it has less. In this sample, it has more here, a little bit less in this one. And this is the data from everything in 10 or more, that's in 10 or more uh, samples. So you can see there's this big group of contexts here where they have this abundance, it goes up, they have this abundance, it goes up, they have this, it goes down. So in all the samples, the relative ratio of this group of contexts is changing at the same rate. So hopefully about half the people in the audience know the answer to the question, why? Oh, crap, nobody was paying attention yesterday, were you? <laughs> so the, the simplest, there is a couple of explanations, but the simplest explanation is that all of those sequences come from the same organism. Right? It's the same genome that's represented. So we pull out those sequences, we do a separate assembly, lo and behold, we can create a complete genome. It looks like a phage, it smells like a phage, it is about 100 KB, it has phage-like promoter sequences, it has phage-like uh, other sequences. Remember the story of why phages are cool, or why the study was cool that Alejandro did, and since the last couple of talks have been bashing on um, these kind of stack bar graphs, this is why you shouldn't do stack bar graphs. Okay, so here, phages are really cool, right? Because they're all doing different things, yeah? Yes, they are. Okay, <laughs> now we normalize this data to include all of the unknown sequences. All right, so now, that stack bar graph looks a little different, they're all basically doing the same thing, they're not doing very much. <laughs> but then, we add in crassage, and lo and behold, some of the samples have like 80-90% of the reads up from crassage. As Katrina said, we call it um, crassage because, well, first of all, the tool that Baz wrote, he wanted to call crass with a capital A. That's like, really, dude? But yeah, it'll be funny, everyone will love it. <laughs> and then, when he came up with the phase, he's like, well, I want to use that to promote my tool. So people use my tool, so I'm going to call it Crass Phage. So that's why it's called Crass Phage. We didn't have the <laughs> So, we've got this phage. It's in a bunch of kids in Missouri, or wherever I've kept going. <laughs> what we like to know is, where else can we find it? When we did the initial study, we looked at a bunch of metagenomes, and so we went to the sequence read archive. So the sequence read archive, this is the growth of the sequence read archive over time. Yeah, a little bit over here now. And the yellow is the amount of data. We've got terabases of data that's just sitting there that nobody's using. And so in my group, we've actually spent quite a long time trying to build new tools to analyze this data and figure out what's going on with this data. One of the um, tools that we came up with is a classification system called PARTY, which will take data from the SRA, automatically tell you whether it's a random metagenome, whether it's a 16S study, whether it's a cancer biology study or something like that. And we've used it to classify all of the SRA data sets so that we can now immediately go and pull out just the random metagenomes out of the sequence we got. Um, we've got about 80,000, in fact, we're closing in on 100,000 random community metagenomes that are publicly available and people aren't analyzing. So if you want data to analyze, there's a ton of it, and if you go to my website, we'll tell you how to get all of that data. And as a test, we compared several different phages to see how abundant they are in different metagenomes. So here's one that we did for Katrina. It was not very abundant. T7, T4, T4, T22, 
B2, these are E. coli phages. B22 is a very famous salmonella phage. That's really just so we've got a benchmark. How often do we see phages if we just do this kind of search? Phi X174, the most abundant phage on the planet. Sound right. <laughs> Anybody know why Phi X174 is the most abundant phage on the planet? <laughs> Because when you do 16S sequencing using Illumina, you spike it with Phi X174. It's the most sequenced phage on the planet. These are contaminated data sets, where the random sequencing has been contaminated, either the pipettes are contaminated, the machine is contaminated, or even. Oh, bad. Okay, that's crass phage. So we've got a lot of crass phage. It's in about 10,000 metagenomes. And so we can take those 10,000 metagenomes and we can plot along the bottom here our phage genome. This is in uh, hundreds of base pairs of the VFD there. And we can just plot the coverage in each metagenome. And we can see there's a lot of crash rate. It's really abundant. You can go find it all over the place. It's a super abundant phage. So we wanted to ask the question, if it's really that abundant, it's in all these metagenomes, we should be able to PCR from the environment. And so when we want to get something good, we go to Mexico. <laughs> and it's an excuse to go party. In Mexico, it turns out that the US built a sewage plant right down here in the border. Here's um, San Diego State's right here. Somewhere, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, UCSD is up off the top and we're kind of way up. Um, but this is uh, the border, the, the sewage comes through Tijuana, and there's a river that flows right here. And then when the river hits the ocean, the current takes it up to uh, Coronado, nice. which is one of the most expensive places in San Diego. <laughs> and so we can't have that, right? So we've got the sewage plant that takes all the sewage, treats it, and then drops everything back across the border. <laughs> Uh, the sewage plant's right there, there it is. So we went down to the sewage plant and we got some sewage, like 60 liters of it. <laughs> and we did some PCR and it turns out that we got the size of fragments that we require, but we only need two microliters of raw influent. So this is the sewage coming down the pipe into the sewage plant. For two microliters we can PCR craft stage. Oh, that's pretty cool. So we went back to this figure and we designed some um, primers because what this figure shows is that there are conserved regions, like this region where it's all blue, and then there are some different regions where we're having some gene exchange within the phage. So we designed different primers, some to conserved regions and some to different regions, and we asked people um, to basically Designed to make the primers, get some sewage from your local sewage plant, and do a PCR on that. We've been pretty lucky with our response. We've actually got a few more. Now we have some samples from Africa, and we've got a whole bunch of samples from Australia. They were just a bit slow in getting the data to us, because they're at the beach, probably. Um, but we've got samples essentially from every continent where people have gone to the sewage plant, taken a sample, done PCR, sequenced it and sent us the sequences. And what we see when we make trees out of those sequences is a really strong signal where each country mm -hmm. is clustering. Right? So if we get sewage from some place, we test the crash phage in it, we can tell you what country it's from. There's a really strong country signal. So what I just told you is that there's a phage that's globally distributed in humans. So how? Where does it come from? Anybody have any idea? Yeah. Sorry? Africa. <laughs> I'm being blamed on Africa. <laughs> The apple. The apple. <laughs> the apple? <laughs> well, so this I got two theories. One is that it's in food that we're eating. 
And what's the only food that everybody on the planet eats? McDonald's. McDonald's. Exactly. Really? So this one theory is that this is actually synthetic, made by McDonald's, and it's a way they use to test how old the hamburgers are. <laughs> the other theory is that it's evolutionary really old, and that there's a phage and a bacteria and a human that have been evolving over time and have been spreading out around the globe. Well, McDonald's, one or the other. <laughs> so that's cool. It's globally distributed. But then what happens when we look at specific locations? And so uh, this is Poland. And I had a student that came to work in my lab for a while from Poland. And when he went back, he was super excited about crassphage, of course. Why wouldn't you be? <laughs> and so he drove all over Poland and got samples from these cities that I'm not going to even try and pronounce. And this is the distance in kilometers between those cities. Kilometers yeah. between Poland. Here's the cities. And when you look at the distribution of crassphage, basically you see that there's a, a signal based on the city. So each city has its own crassphage. So we could tell if you're from New York or from San Diego. Yeah. So that's in Poland. Then we got some students in San Diego, and they're pretty enthusiastic, but they're really not quite as enthusiastic as the Polish, because they just really went to the party as well. Less than 20 kilometers apart. But it took just as long to drive. It did take just as long. It probably took longer to drive. Um, so here's TJ. So basically, we are up in... Uh, Kind of northern San Diego County, so just between here and San Diego. Uh, this is Alex who did most of the work. And now what we see is a different story. Because now we see separation by date. Mm -hmm. So we've got a date signal that comes through if you're in a small environment. So we've actually gone back and we've got more samples, <laughs> and it seems like crash stage is changing in a, with a period of about two weeks. So if you go down to less than two weeks, even though it's every day, you don't see the date signals. You go back and see more of a, a location signal. But up over about a two-week period, you start seeing the date signal. So what that means is that you guys are sharing crash phage, and it's sweeping through the population and taking over with a period of about two weeks. Cool. So how many types of crash phage do we have if it's changing that, that quickly? So we went back to the metagenomics data, and basically we do kind of, this is for the bioinformaticians in the crowd, yay, look, it's a secret appointment. <laughs> um, we do this kind of thing, and we say, look, here's some mutations, right? So in this place, we've got a T, or here we've got two T's for the change, and we've got two A's and two T's and two T's. These two bottom sequences are different from the sequences above them. They're a different genotype. Right. And there's some software that you can use that pulls out specific genotypes and tells you how many genotypes there are. So in this study, we took 300 of the metagenomes and counted how many genotypes of crassphage we find in the metagenomes. And most people have either one or two genotypes. A few people have more. Um, some people have not quite so many. So then, he said, you know, if that's true, it's really abundant, a lot of people have it, we should be able to get a bunch of volunteers, after all, saying it, okay? a lot of students, and we could test them and see if they've got crash phase. And so that's what we did. So I had two students, Holly and Maria, who over the summer took volunteers, they screened them at the beginning of the summer to identify whether they have crash phase, or whether they don't have crass phage. And then over the summer, they took samples from every week, and then some weeks they did every day as well. And what we see is that there are some people that start off positive, and then they, we can't detect crass phage, and then they get it back again. And then there are some people, the poor sad people, that never have it. What we don't know, what we're, we're waiting on the sequences, because this was a project they just finished, we don't know whether the crash phase that they have that we won is the same as the one that we applied 
and in the intervening weeks is just below the limit of detection, or whether the crash stage of week one is being replaced by a new crash stage of week five. Then we're working on a piece of security maybe. Um, so we have some data on that. But so I think we have two people that are cohabiting, one who has crash stage and one who doesn't. And that's all I'm going to say about that, because those people may or may not be in the audience, so I probably should shut up. <laughs> Isn't it time for wine? <laughs> okay, so basically, like I said, this is a super abundant thing. About half of people have it. We've tested, um, actually, this is number... So we tested 41 volunteers, actually that's not true, because I just had two more people tell me yesterday, so now we have 43. Um, that we've tested, and 20 out of 43 are positive. So basically, uh, half the people have a crash stage. It's super abundant. In some of the metagenomes, 90% of the reads will come from crash stage. Super abundant phage. Um, it probably is affecting bacteroides. Um, we find it everywhere. So like I said, um, it's a phage, it's everywhere. Rounding up everybody has it, um, <laughs> we have no idea why, and it's evolving with us. Um, the global collaboration has been awesome. We've got a lot of people that have been involved. People have been going out and getting samples and sending us data. And one of the keys to that was that we would not send primers to people. We kind of want to send US crash phase to them. So everybody made primers. So it's possible that what everybody sequenced is crash phase from IBT. But hopefully not. <laughs> and this is my lab that actually do all of the work, like I said. Give talks. Thank you very much. And I'd really like everybody to thank Jen and Katrina for putting on such a terrific symposium. I've been doing every single talk for every minute of the day. And um, I'm happy to take your questions. Great. We definitely have time for questions, and I also just want to mention that Larry Smarr will give a couple of closing remarks at the conclusion of the questions before the wine. So, great. So, so the question is, <laughs> is whether you can use crash stage as a forensic marker. And I, I've had that discussion with some people that might be interested in forensic marker. And, um, you know, especially like knowing where people have been and if they've been in the various places. Um, we haven't yet got that up and running, but it, it sure is an interesting idea. So studying the microbiome to understand where people mm -hmm. have been and what they've been doing for sure. Um, so to my knowledge, there's only one NSF grant on, only one grant on a crash wave, it's not for me. Um, and it actually is to use crash wave as an environmental um, fecal monitoring um, marker, because it's very human specific. And if you use coliforms, as you know, lots of things have E. coli or E. coli bacteria. Crash wave is human specific, and so you can use it and that's being done by Kyle Bibby, who's at Notre Dame. Yeah, absolutely. And so the question is, is it just this one? Is this one special? Um, so imagine what I said at the start. We did this cross-assembly. We found this phage. So if you take that data, throw away everything that's crash phage, not throw away, put it in a special pot, but then use the rest of the data, and then repeat the experiment, right? Reassemble, redo it, and then go look for that. And so you can do that, and, and there was a great paper out about that from um, Kevin Young's group where they did that uh, in the, from the gut. But it's absolutely, you find more and more pages like this. Of course. Do you find any crash signatures? We do not, and so um, 
So, kind of what you're alluding to is what's the focus of the cafe, and where is it, and where is it hanging out. Um, so there's only one scar that I'm aware of. We looked really, really hard to identify anything, any similarities between craftsmen and any bacterium that might suggest, for example, integration into the chromosome or a CRISPR-Cas system. And earlier this year, uh, there's a protella genome that was released where the CRISPR, uh, um, the CRISPR state cell is from craftsmen. And so we think that craftsmen is at least infecting that protella. But I don't think, based on a whole bunch of other evidence, that that's the actual host of craft stage. And what my guys, what Holly and Maria are also doing, in addition to collecting food from students in craft stage, is trying to isolate craft stage. Could you construct craft stage? Yeah, we talked about doing that actually. We, took, we designed the primers to do the long range PCR, the long range PCR, and then do the in vivo recombination. Um, but we haven't done it. We just designed the primer to do that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I probably just keep each other before I drop, maybe. Don't you have it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. There are other things. Other than you have a problem. Good question. So the question is do we find crassoids in other species other than humans? So, sort of. Um, we don't find it, I think what we don't find it in first, we don't find it in dogs, cats, cows, sheep, um, you know, other stuff that hangs around with humans. And it's a very human specific model. We've been looking at some metagenomes from non human primates, and we find something that looks like crassway in howlers, lemurs, baboons. But it looks like it's a really distant relative. And so we're actually struggling with this because we're struggling to try and assemble that genome and we're trying to do the same thing. Do a cross assembly, assemble the genome so we can build a genome scale file in a tree to, fix, to basically use as an algorithm. So it looks like there's a signal in non human primates, but we haven't been able to exactly get it. So we really should try it, at least as one can say. So the, the question is, is there any part of the human microbiome that changes over a period of two weeks? And I think pretty much every part of the human microbiome changes over that. Especially in so your intestine, of course, you wash out about once a day, and then bacteria have to grow again. And it, it's really traditional, like kill the winner type ecology. The bacteria grows up, becomes dominant, a phage evolves to attack it, that kills that bacteria, creates a niche, another a mutation occurs and makes the bacteria resistant to the phage. That phage, that bacteria grows up, that phage. So, but that's been happening for millennia, right? These things are evolving with us for a long time. And so they're just in this constant answer. Hey, um, over about a two week period. It's crazy. So any idea how long we would persist in the environment? We haven't been able to really find it in the environment. The only environments that we found it in the sewage, the sewage. Right, so, so we find it in sewage. Easily, and we haven't. Well, we we have left sewage in the fridge, but we haven't gone back and tested it. <laughs> but it's still in the fridge, <laughs> so we could test it. <laughs> um, yeah, we haven't we haven't done that experiment. But but we actually don't find this thing like in streams or rivers or places like that unless they're contaminated with fill, things like that. Right. Okay, let's just say Rob again.